I forgot to grab those plates that we made. I'll bring them on Thursday. They're starting to make my office smelly, so I'm sure by Thursday I'll want to get them out of there. When I ran out, I forgot to grab them, but we'll look at them. I think we already actually talked about biotechnology and genetic engineering. They kind of go together. Biotechnology is using <coughs> microbial organisms and biochemical techniques to solve some particular problem, maybe making a protein or making enzymes or making other chemicals that um, we want to use down the road for some particular product. And then genetic engineering is specifically taking genes from one organism, moving them into another. And we do that for a lot of different things, uh, d disease resistance in plants, but we've also made microorganisms express human proteins um, that we need for therapeutic uses. Most microorganisms, in fact, 99.5 or 99.9% .9 aren't pathogenic don't cause disease, but there are a few pathogens. And I think, didn't we talk about this last time, the, the influenza? So I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but this is the main reason that, that people get um, concerned when influenza comes out every winter like it is right now, because millions of people died from that particular strain of influenza. Um, the golden age of microbiology was um, uh, coined as the theory of spontaneous generation was disproved. Basically, the disproval of that showed that there were microorganisms in the environment that were growing and potentially causing disease. Um, during this same gold, golden age of microbiology, the large majority of the pathogenic bacteria that we currently know of were already identified during those 40 years, roughly. Uh, work on viruses started, vaccines to prevent disease already started. Um, <clears throat> smallpox was a, a huge killer. 10 million people, and it's recorded through history over 40 years of killing lots of people, including the, the Aztecs. And there's been major attempts to eradicate it. Uh, most authorities believe no reported cases have occurred since 1977. There's been a few outbreaks that look like smallpox. I don't know of any that have been confirmed to be smallpox. Um, then there's the plague. Uh, about a third of the population of Europe died from the plague. Um, in just those few years, over 25 million individuals. You guys, when you were kids, sang a fun little song as you were playing in the playgrounds with your friends, London Bridge is Falling Down, remember that song? And then you kind of all fell down. Did, do you know where the origin of that song came from? As kids, you were probably singing it because it's a catchy tune, but it was actually originally invented because everyone that got the plague was falling down dead, and that's thus the we all fall down part. If you got the plague, plague you were going to fall down dead. Now we know that that's a bacterial organism, and, and today fewer than 100 people worldwide die from the organism that caused the plague. We know it's transmitted by rodents, and so we can limit rodents in our environment and thus limit the bacteria that causes the plague. Also, we have antibiotics to treat the plague these days. And so we can help um, keep death or mortality down from that particular organism. Even so, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, especially true in viral diseases, diseases associated with poverty. Um, many of those areas, a lot of work to do. Respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases still cause most of the illness in the world and also the deaths in the world. Cholera outbreaks around the world are one of the major killers of people around the world today. And you'll get to look at that bacterium, Vibrio cholerae, in the laboratory this week as you're looking in. And it's uh, curable. It's also preventable, the cholera infections, um, pretty easily. But um, a lot of education that needs to happen there. Uh, the United States, uh, roughly 750 million infections happen every year. Fortunately, not that many deaths happen, about 200,000 deaths every year. And I think last time you'll remember I told you somewhere between 30 and 35,000 of those 200,000 are related to influenza infections. That's pretty expensive to treat all of those infections, billions of, and we'll do something later. I haven't got that set up for you. Billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on health care every year. And so that's microbiology is a major issue. I'm not going to go through all of the things on this particular slide, but I'll point out a few things that I think will be of interest to you. You guys have all heard of this E. coli O157H7. 
It's an outbreak. The first one that was recognized was about 1982. It's a different strain of E. coli. We talked previously about how all of us have E. coli in our guts, but we don't have this strain. However, most cattle have this strain of E. coli in their guts, and it doesn't do anything to cattle. It's not a pathogen for cattle, but it is a pathogen for humans. And so if that strain gets out of the cattle and or mixed in with the meat and the meat's not cooked well and a person ingests this per particular strain of E. coli, it can actually kill you. Or if the cattle feces somehow get into a water supply and the organism's not killed and, it, the, and then ingested by a human, again, that particular strain of E. coli can very readily kill you. In fact, medicine's always a learning curve. When we first saw this strain came, come out, the doctor said they saw it in the bloodstream. E. coli doesn't usually get in the bloodstream, but this one's got some different characteristics. And they saw this E. coli in the bloodstream, and <clears throat> they said, oh, it's E. coli. We know how to kill it. So they started throwing ampicillin at the E. coli, a derivative of penicillin. And sure enough, it killed the E. coli. But as soon as the cells lysed, they released all kinds of toxins. And within a matter of hours, the first nine or ten people that were treated that way died from toxic shock because the toxins were released into the bloodstream, their blood pressure dropped, and all the fluids and the capillaries in the blood system flowed out into the tissues, and their heart rate and pulse and blood pressure couldn't be maintained. The doctors quickly started putting through their channels, don't treat E. coli with ampicillin. There's a new strain out there that if you do, your patient will, in a matter of hours, die. So. Uh, this strain's a, a pretty bad one, and we'll come back to it, but it picked up about a fifth of its chromosome from a cousin. Remember, we talked about how previously DNA moves around. It's not as stable as we thought, and this guy picked up about a million base pairs. Its normal genome for E. coli is about four million base pairs. It picked up about a million base pairs from one of its cousins that had more toxins and more ability to cause severe disease, and now it can cause significantly more severe disease in humans. There's lots of interesting ones here. AIDS came out and, and was first observed in humans in the U.S. in about 81. Legionnaire's disease is another interesting one. Cryptosporidium, we'll come back and talk about it more, but it's the swimming pool and um, nursery disease. And there's lots of fun diseases here. SARS came out in 2002. I was living in China when that happened, and pretty interesting how they dealt with that process. So there are all kinds of emerging diseases. Most of them are newly recognized. There's lots of examples, and we've, you can see these on the previous page. Um, West Nile virus, I think that's actually where we ended last time, isn't it? It feels like it is. Um, West Nile virus is one that uh, this time of year and throughout the summer is a big problem because um, it's pretty uh, indigenous in the cattle and horse populations here in central Texas. So every year you hear about people dying from West Nile virus. But emerging diseases frequently arise because of changing lifestyles, and that gives the organism an opportunity to spread to new hosts and also closer contact with animals. It's the case of the hantavirus, also SARS, and a number of others. And also the, those biological organisms are constantly evolving. They're constantly trying to figure out how to survive in different environments, if you think of them as actively doing that. But if you don't, they're mutating and they're changing, and sometimes those mutations allow them to survive and persist and cause disease in hosts that they couldn't previously. Then there's those re-emerging diseases. Those are the ones that we have pretty much gotten control of, but for some reason or another, they have popped back up. One of the reasons that we're seeing these days is because vaccination campaigns have been very effective. Vaccination campaigns have prevented a lot of diseases, so parents are thinking, no one has this disease, nobody gets this disease, I don't need to vaccinate my children anymore, but the organism is still in the environment, and when you get a high enough population of unvaccinated people, then the organism begins to pop back out again. A lot of that thought process is because of lack of first-hand knowledge of diseases, and, and there are things like measles. Measles, the disease itself, the, the primary disease that you see, is not that significant. You get a few pustules on your skin, and you're uncomfortable for a week, 10 days, and then the virus appears to go away, but the measles virus actually 
in most individuals doesn't entirely go away. It makes its way into the brain, persists in the brain. It can't replicate in the brain tissue, but it sits there and it tries. And it mutates and mutates and mutates until at some point, usually 7, 10, 15, 20 years later, one of those virus particles mutates in a way that now it can grow in the brain tissue. Then it starts infecting the cells of the brain and it causes a different sort of disease and it makes the brain harden and makes the brain not function and that particular disease can be lethal. It can interfere with the auto autonomic responses of breathing and other things that we do and those individuals can die from that particular virus. So that's just an idea to help you. We'll come back and talk about vaccines and things as we get further down the road in this chapter. These emerging diseases, um, many times pathogens become resistant to antimicrobials. We've got a problem with tuberculosis. There are countries that have strains of tuberculosis that are resistant to all the antibiotics that we have. And there's other malarial agents that are becoming resistant to our different therapies for malaria as well. Another problem is increased travel and immigration and the diseases spreading from um, less developed countries into the developed countries. Also, their population changes. We're living longer than we ever have before, and as we live longer in the elderly, we're seeing more people with weakened immune systems. Also, we've got changes because of disease that have changed the immune system, and when we get weakened immunity, then we see more diseases emerging and coming out. Uh, chronic diseases uh, also are out there that might be caused by bacteria. Helicobacter pylori is one of those guys. That's the guy that's associated with stomach ulcers. But indigestion, Crohn's disease, and others are also thought to have some um, bacterial relationship. So despite all the progress that we've made, there's still a lot of work to be done. And we already talked about that, didn't we? Um, how did I go backward? So, uh, in the relationship to host versus microbe interactions, uh, most of the surfaces of our body are populated by microorganisms. That's certainly true of the skin, it's certainly true of the nasal passages, and it's certainly true of the urogenital areas, the internal areas there, about the only place in the body that isn't normally populated by microorganisms are the lungs. The lungs are normally pretty sterile, except for those transient organisms that come into the lungs. But the organisms that live there are, are beneficial to us, and we call them normal microbiota. Microbiota is just a fancy word to mean all the organisms, the entire population, all the species of organisms that live in a certain place. So we talk about the gut microbiota. That would be all the organisms that live in the human gut. Other people are interested in the soil microbiota. That's all the bugs that live out in the soil or any particular area like that. When we're thinking of the body like we typically do in health-related issues, then um, we're going to call them the normal microbiota or the normal flora. And those guys are there helping to prevent disease. Many of them make antibiotics that don't allow those transient bacteria to come into our systems to be able to survive and grow and reproduce. The normal flora also help keep the immune system primed. The immune system is constantly looking at those bugs that are in and on us and saying, okay, I know you're there, and if you decide to get out of your place where you should be, I'll be ready to respond to you. The other side of that coin is that all bacteria, all microorganisms have similar molecular molecules. And so the normal flora that wouldn't cause disease normally are helping to prime the immune system so if those pathogens come in, they'll be immediately recognized because of the commonality between the cell structure and molecules associated with them. These guys also aid us in digestion. We've talked a little bit about that, enzymes that they make help us break down things that our cells wouldn't be able to break down. On the other side, there are organisms that are pathogens, and these guys damage body tissue and lead to some sort of disease symptom, and we'll come back and we'll talk about that quite a bit as we go through. One other side of the microbial world is that these guys are really wonderful organisms to study. When you guys took anatomy and physiology, I'm sure you were enamored by glycolysis and mesmerized by the TCA cycle and how all of that stuff worked. And 
you probably didn't realize that that stuff that you know that happens now in your cells actually wasn't figured out in human cells first. It was actually figured out in bacteria first. So the glycolysis, TCA cycle, pentose phosphate pathway or shunt, whichever your book called it, those were all figured out long before, and most of them in E. coli, uh, because E. coli and other bacteria are really easy to work with. They're, as far as genetic systems go, it's much easier to make mutations in bacterial cells than it is eukaryotic cells because they typically only have one chromosome and you only have to mutate one copy of the gene. The cells do things the same way. They synthesize molecules the same way. They're composed of similar elements like DNA, RNA, proteins, ribosomes, all of those things, and they replicate DNA and RNA the same way. And much of the met metabolic pathways of one type of bacterium or another are very similar to what happens in your cells. <coughs> Jacques Minotti is a famous scientist, a French scientist. He said, what's true of elephants is also true of bacteria, and bacteria are much easier to study. If I had gotten those plates down here, you would have seen some plates that had hundreds of colonies on them. And each colony that you can see has over a million cells in it. As soon as you can see it, a pinpoint colony has over a million bacterial cells in it. Getting a million elephants in a room this size, let alone a trillion elephants, would be somewhat dangerous and more difficult to study. And so we can do a lot of things with bacteria that we can't in other systems. Um, out in the world, there are enormous numbers. We know of other um, 10,000 times more species of bacteria than we do of mammals. You guys are more familiar with mammals because you've got that cute, fuzzy little dog or cat or um, other mammal that might live at home with you. And some hairy creature, and there are 10,000 times more species that we know of um, in the microbial world. There's a lot of biodiversity, too. You learn the way that your cells do metabolism. As we go through, we're, you're going to learn about some other ways that cells do metabolism. One of the things that I really want you to do as we go through this semester, I know most of you are going to tell me, I just want to be a nurse. But nurses really have to be scientists. You have to make observations. You have to figure out what that observation means and then figure out what to do in response to that observation. And that's what scientists do as well. I really want you to start thinking as scientists as you're going through this class. And if you, as you realize, what we're talking about is there are so many microbes out there that could jump out and get us. We have to have ways to protect ourselves either prior to them jumping out to get us or after they jump out some ways to get rid. And almost always what we do is try to target things that those cells do differently than our cells. Because if we throw a chemical at our bodies to get those bad guys and it hits the mechanisms that our cells use, it's going to cause as much damage to our cells as it is to that pathogen that's causing disease. So we're always looking for differences in the organisms or infectious agents that cause disease. It's called selective toxicity. And basically, we want to find chemicals or molecules that interfere with processes that those cells do that don't interfere with the processes that our cells do, or at least not as much. And so we have to take advantage of this biodiversity and find ways that these things do processes more differently. So of all the microorganisms we know of, we can grow far less than 1% of those guys in the laboratory. And pretty much the reason for that is we can't and haven't figured out what they need to be able to grow. What kind of growth conditions do they need? What nutrients do they need? What other molecules or growth factors do they need? Some microorganisms, even bacteria, have to live inside of a animal cell to be able to grow and divide, at least that's the only way that we know to be able to get them to grow. Some of them have very complex growth requirements. Others are very easy to grow, and you'll play with some of those in the laboratory so we can do some things more quickly. If we look at the microbial world, in fact, if we look at all the world, we can divide it into three different domains. Uh, some of you, as you're going through your junior high, middle school, high school biology classes, you learned about the Whitaker system, right? And remember, the Whitaker system had five kingdoms. And so basically, this system of three domains was proposed by Carl Woese back in the late 70s, uh, 
and uh, still some textbooks haven't switched over, but most of the scientific community has switched over to the three domain system. One of the reasons is one of those five kingdoms in the Whitaker system kind of became like your kitchen junk drawer. There was so much stuff crammed in there that was so different and unrelated to each other in that particular kingdom that that particular part of the system became totally non-functional. Nobody knew what should be put in there. Nobody knew what was in there. And so relating organisms together, and the reason for having these classification systems is so that our minds can keep track of, categorize the different types of organisms that God has created in the world. And because there are so many of them, it's hard for our finite minds to be able to keep track of those. So the Woe system breaks them down into three domains instead of five kingdoms. And it's the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and the do domain eukarya. And we'll talk about these three, dom three domains pretty um, much in detail as we go through. But in each one of these domains, the organisms that are placed in the domain share important properties or characteristics. And we're going to talk through some of those. So in the domain bacteria, all the organisms that are in the domain bacteria are single-celled, and they're also prokaryotic. What do you guys remember from other classes? What does prokaryotic mean? So typically we think no membrane-bound organelles, but what does it literally mean? What does prokaryotic literally mean? Pre-nucleus. Pre-nucleus, before the nucleus. So if you think of things in an evolutionary perspective, like most scientists do, then we're talking these cells evolved before the nucleus became into existence. And that's the way evolutionary scientists would, would think of these guys, that they're pre-nucleus, they're prokaryotic, they don't have a membrane-bound membrane, membrane -bound chromosomes down inside of the cell. Sorry, I got tongue twisted there. And they also don't have membrane-bound organelles. What kind of organelles do you typically think of that are composed of membranes? Mitochondria. Mitochondria would be a good example. What else? Where are most of the proteins synthesized in a eukaryotic cell? On the rough part of the ER, right? Rough part of the endoplasmic reticulum. What other membrane-bound organelles are there besides the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell that you typically think of? Vacuoles, good. What else? Golgi, beautiful. So those are the major ones, and typically, by definition, we don't see those in bacteria. Also, the DNA is sequestered in a part of the cell that's called the nucleoid. If you looked at a TEM of a bacterium, you'd see a nucleoid where the DNA is sequestered down in and it's packed so tightly that all the cytoplasm ex is excluded from that area. And you could almost imagine that it was surrounded by a membrane because it's packed so tightly down in. But it's not. It's just nucleic acids packed into that area. And by definition, there's no membrane around that DNA. Bacteria have typical shapes, and you'll learn some fancy names for these down the road, but some are shaped long and thin like rods. Others are spherical, and some are spiral. And this, by definition, always holds true. Bacteria have a rigid cell wall that contains the molecule called peptidoglycan. If you hear peptide, what does that make you think of? What was it? Peptide, something related to proteins. And peptide is short stretches of amino acids linked together. So not long enough to be a polypeptide, but a peptide is usually two, three, four, five, maybe ten amino acids that are linked together. And what if you hear glycan? What does that make you think of? Yeah, something like glycogen. And what's glycogen made out of? Glucose. So glucose-like molecules strung together. And that's what the cell wall of bacteria is made out of. And you'll get to know in Chapter 3, you'll get to know the exact structure of peptidoglycan. And it's unique to bacteria. The only place that peptidoglycan has been found is in the cell wall of bacteria. So that's an identifying molecule. It's one that your immune system uses as well. When your immune system sees peptidoglycan out in strange places, it says there must be a bacterial infection going on. I need to get excited and start figuring out where this peptidoglycan came from. So again, that goes back to host microbe interaction. Bacteria divide by what we call binary fission. Remember last week in yeast, we saw the yeast budding off and a smaller cell kind of was formed on the side. And in the case of bacteria, uh, we don't say meiosis, mitosis, because they don't have a nucleus, right? And that all describes what's going on with the nucleus. 
in this case, when you've got a bacterial cell, the chromosome does replicate, and then the chromosome moves out to the poles, and then typically the cell will put down a septum in the middle with one chromosome on each side of that septum, and then the cells will separate, and so we call it binary fission. It's somewhat semantics, but it's also descriptive of the process to remind you there's no nuclear division like you'd expect to see in a eukaryotic cell. Uh, some bacteria have flagella. They're beautifully modal, and if you think about that, they want to get to where the good stuff is in your body if you're thinking pathogenesis pathogenicity. Sometimes they just need to get to where the oxygen is in the environment or other things like light, many different things. And so they have flagella to be modal. And one reason you want to join the Facebook group, pretty soon I'm going to start putting links to some videos and other things that are going to help you understand concepts that we're talking about. And there's a beautiful vi video of one of those white cells that you looked at last week, a neutrophil chasing a bacterium around, and you're looking under the, or through the microscope, you can see the bacteria. The bacteria knows that that phagocyte is there and that it's going to kill it. The bacteria is rapidly trying to swim away from the phagocyte. The neutrophil also knows that the bacteria is there, and the neutrophil actively chases the bacteria around the field of view, and they're both sending signals to let the other know, hey, I'm here, and the bacteria wants to run for its life, and the neutrophil knows I'm programmed to eat whatever that is, and it keeps chasing it until the neutrophil finally catches it and um, is able then to ingest it and to kill it. Uh, some mechanisms of the immune system grab onto the flagellum of a bacterium so that they can't swim anymore, and that helps those phagocytic cells be able to find those pathogens and be able to get at them more quickly. When you think of flagellum, I know most of your brains are going back to what you saw in other biology classes, including anatomy and physiology, with sets of microtubules around the outside and the central tubules and all that and a membrane on the outside. Bacterial flagella are completely different. They use a different power source. They move by a different mechanism. We'll talk about all of those as we go through. Then there's the archaea. They get, these guys are like bacteria in that they're prokaryotic. They have similar shapes and appearance to bacteria. They also divide by binary fissions, as bacteria do, and some of these also have flagella. They also have rigid cell walls. But by definition, they don't have peptidoglycan in those cell walls because, remember, only, mem only members of the domain bacteria have peptidoglycan. But sometimes the material that's in the cell walls of the archaea is so similar that scientists hedge. They don't want to call it peptidoglycan, but they call it pseudopeptidoglycan because structurally it's similar, but it's not the same as peptidoglycan. Also, if you look down at the RNAs that are embedded in those ribosomes that are down inside of the cell making proteins, the RNAs have different structures down inside that tell us that these groups are two genetically distinct groups of organisms. Another interesting fact is that the archaea, many of them are extremophiles. Some of them can only grow in ice crystals. If you raise the temperature up to room temperature, it's too hot for them, and they won't be able to grow, and many times they will die. Others of them, how many of you turn on your faucet at home, let the hot water alone run for a few minutes, and then stuck your hand underneath and said, ouch, when you stuck? Have you done that before? If you haven't, you need to do that just so you can experience that. The U.S. government has regulated hot water heaters. They can only go up to 65 degrees centigrade because they don't want children to get scalded by the hot water. It's still pretty darn hot and it'll hurt if you hold your hand there very long. A few seconds will make your hand be very red when you pull it out. There are some organisms that can only grow in that temperature. For us, that's pretty darn hot, but many organisms can only grow at that temperature. I'll just give you a good example. When we first moved here from China, I came back, I interviewed, I looked at houses, I saw one that I thought was pretty and I liked, took lots of pictures, showed my wife, and we bought the house before we actually moved back from China. We got back and she said, yeah, it's pretty, but it's too small. We lived there for about a year. We had four kids living with us at that point. And uh, we knew that it was too small for us, and so we, we bought another place. At that point, properties weren't selling very well. And so that house sat on the market for a little over a year. When I thought people, if they come to the house, they want to know that all the appliances work. So I left the electricity on. I left the hot water heater going. And so the hot water heater was hot. 
but no one was living in the house, so no water was running into the hot water heater. And one day, after about six months, I came back, and I hadn't done it before. I turned on the hot water, and when I turned it on, it came out black as coal. It came out just dark black, and it stunk like rotten eggs. The water was in there. It was being maintained at 65 degrees, and no fresh chlorine was being brought in to keep the bacteria under control. And these guys got in there, and they grew and made lots of beautiful chemicals that smelled really bad. And now I said, okay, if people come in to buy the house, they do that. Nobody's going to want to buy the house. And so the house smelled right like rotten eggs. I got a garden hose. I hooked it up to the hot water heater. I took it out to the curb, and I let the water flush through the hot water heater for about an hour until it ran clear, and now the whole neighborhood smelled like rotten eggs. <laughs> anyway, the, these are some of these guys that grow at 65 degrees, and because no fresh chlorine was being brought in, now they had a beautiful environment to be able to grow and th thrive down inside of that hot water heater. And most of the time we're putting fresh water into the hot water heater, so there's plenty of chlorine to keep the microorganisms there, keep them from... Um, growing. There are other organisms, that was 65 degrees, there are other organisms that only grow and divide when the, when the temperature is about 95 degrees. Water boils at 100 and these guys called hyperthermophiles need to be up at that temperature near boiling water temperatures to be able to grow and thrive. We'll talk about where that can happen here on the face of the earth, but there are some places where that situation occurs. There are others that can survive very, very high salt concentrations. Normally, we put salt in food to kill organisms. That's why originally people used brine to cure ham and other types of meat, because the salt would kill most of those microorganisms, but there are some that actually need those high salt concentrations. Then the third domain is the domain eukarya. These guys are the eukaryotes, and eu means true. The letters EU together, pronounced U, means true. So these guys have a true nucleus. They have a nucleus. They have other membrane-bound organelles as well. They're much more complex, much more compartmentalized than the prokaryotes. And uh, members of the microbial world that fall into this are going to be the fungi, the algae, the protozoan. And those guys um, will be the members of the eukarya that we'll consider. The algae and the protozoan are also termed protist. Remember that Whitaker system kingdom that caused problems? What was that called? Kingdom pro protista, right? Kingdom protista. That's not used so much. Protista is not used so much, but protist is used. And protist means a eukaryotic cell that is a singular, single-celled organism. So the algae and the protozoan fall into that group of protists. Then there's some other multicellular parasites like the worms and, and a few others that we'll talk about as we go through. Worms are considered in microbiology because many times they're characterized by the eggs, the shape and other characteristics of the eggs, and that's how we diagnose a worm infection in many cases is the presence and the characteristics of those ages. If we focus on the al algae for a little bit, this particular algal cell right here, is one that you guys will get to see before too long. Before too long, I'll have a sample of pond water from Burt Pond, and you guys will actually make your own slides, and you'll get to see the beautiful creatures that are down inside of that pond water. And almost every semester, some students see a, an algal cell that looks a lot like that one living down inside of that pond. The algae are, again, a diverse group. They're eukaryotes. They're single-celled. Some of them, and some of them are multicellular. When we do that laboratory, I'll show you some macroalgae that obviously are uh, multicellular that we'll look at as well. All of them are photosynthetic. They contain chloroplast um, with chlorophyll and or other photosynthetic pigments to um, do the photosynthetic processes that they do. These guys typically live in water. Um, some of them live out in mo moist soil as well. They have a, a rigid cell wall but their cell walls are typically composed of um, uh, cellulose and, and carbohydrates similar to cellulose. Some of these guys actually are flagellated. Some of them are modal, and their processes, um, the flagella helps them with that. But again, the structure of the flagella in the eukaryotes is much different from those in the prokaryotes. 
And then there's the fungi. These guys, too, are a diverse group. You already looked at some cells that look a lot like these yeast cells right here. And if you look at this, you can see some really nice budding that's happening here in this particular picture. You can see those buds, and, and the yeast, you already know, persists as single cells, typically, and they go through that process of budding. And then if you ever did that spontaneous generation theory experiment where you made your pot of coffee and you came back a week or so later and saw those beautiful colored colonies that were down on the surface of the co coffee, you were actually seeing these guys. And these little spheres are called conidia, and those are asexual spores, and they usually have some sort of pigment. Some have an orangish pigment, some have a brown pigment, some have green pigment, some have a black pigment, and you can tell the, the different types of uh, fun, fungus by looking at those. In one of those heads, there are probably two, three, five hundred spores down inside, and each one of those wants to float away and start a new colony. There are some fungi that are called dimorphic. What does morphology mean? Somebody tell me what morphology means. Each one of you is morphologically different from the other. Shape, size, some characteristic like that. Morphology is something that you can appear. So when you looked at the budding yeast, you saw most of them had a kind of oval shape. That would be a description of their morphology. Some of them were elongated. They had an abnormal morphology. And so what do you think dimorphic means? Two shapes. Two different shapes. And so we typically think of yeast growing as oval cells like you see in this picture, but there are some pathogenic yeasts that actually are dimorphic, and when you culture them in the laboratory, they grow predominantly like yeast, but when they start causing disease in the body, they take on a more elongated shape so that they can penetrate and push their way through tissues to find places where they'll, they'll be able to grow. The fungi get their energy from degrading organic material, primarily live on the land if they don't live in or on animals. And so we'll come back and we'll talk about those guys a good bit. And then, there, again, we're in the domain Eukarya. We've got the protozoa. Again, this is a very diverse group, and there's a nice paramecium depicted here. If you look at this beautiful guy, I'm going to call him a guy, but um, if you look, covered with beautiful cilia, short structures that it uses for motility, we have to keep our two legs coordinated to be able to walk or run, and sometimes we have problems with that and fall down. This guy's got to coordinate hundreds of cilia to be able to move in the direction that it wants to go. These guys are more complex than prokaryotes because, again, they're eukaryotic and they're compartmentalized. But if you look at the outside of that cell, it doesn't have a rigid cell wall. What it does have on the outside is two membranes on the outside, and those membranes have molecules like different sterile groups embedded in them to make them more rigid. And then the cilia many times go all the way through both of those membranes and are anchored down inside so that they can be coordinated together. These guys typically ingest organic compounds. There's some great videos out there showing some of these protozoa actually ingesting other protozoa and killing them and breaking them down. Again, they don't have a rigid cell wall. They've got a double membrane layer on the outside. Most of these guys are going to be modal so they can get from one place to another. Okay. So there's so many bugs out there that it's hard for us to keep them straight. So we have to give them some name. In fact, we're still continuing on that command that was given to Adam to name all of the animals, all the organisms that are out there. We're still trying to find them and, and name them because there's so many that are out there. And we use a two-word system called a binomial system to name the organisms. And you guys know this. The first one is the genus, and genus is always written with the first letter capitalized, and then the second one is the species, and the species is not capitalized, but they're both either always underlined or always italicized. So just to give you a heads up on your lab reports, if you ever, and you will frequently have to write genus species names, either make your handwriting so obviously italicized that there's no question about it,
or underline them, and it's usually just easier to go ahead and underline genus species names. And when those are graded, we're going to be looking for that to make sure that you know that a genus species name needs to be either italicized or underlined. And if you underline it, it's much less debatable than, oh, look, I shifted the font on my handwriting in this place. You should have recognized that. So go ahead, and if you want to try to italicize them, that's great, but probably best just to underline them so we know. And then there won't be any debate. This organism, you guys know, you guys know it as E. coli, but the original name was given to this guy, actually it's not the original name, to include this, Escherich. Genus species names are always descriptive. And there was a scientist that spent about 40, 50 years of his life figuring out all that metabolism that you learned in anatomy and physiology. He was a German scientist, and his family name was Escherich. And when he passed away, the scientific community said, hey, we should memorialize him. We should honor him. And this organism had a different name, but the scientific community agreed, let's change the name to memorialize him. And so they took Escherich, and then they tried to make it sound Latin, so they added the I. A at the end of it to make it sound a little bit Latin. So Escherichia coli. And coli is short for coliform. Coliform is an organism that lives in the gut. And so both of the names, the genus name and the species name, are descriptive for this organism. And you're going to find as we go along, that's typically the case, that those names have some meaning, are descriptive, and provide some understanding of what the organism is. We can abbreviate the genus name by just using the capitalized first letter and a period and put that just before the species name, and that's how we typically write those names. In the laboratory, obviously you can abbreviate, but I would encourage you from the beginning to write out all of the genus species names. You might get credit for the particular point as you're writing them with the abbreviated genus. But when it comes to the final lab exam, we're going to expect that you're going to spell out perfectly the genus species name of each of the organisms that you're playing with. So go ahead and get used to writing out and learning the spelling of the genus species names of those guys as we're going through the process. So in the microbial world, there are some non-living organisms, non-living organisms, not the right word, non-living members of the microbial world. And you are familiar with probably the viruses, but probably most of you haven't heard of viroids or prions, maybe prions, prior to reading this chapter. We can't call these guys organisms because they're not cells. They're not living. They're not dividing. So we call them acellular infectious agents. They're not alive, so we have to give them some other name. But sometimes we do call them microbes, which, which is kind of a general term that includes bacteria and all those other members that we're talking about. But we can't call them mi microorganisms because they're not alive. One that you're most familiar with, and yet maybe not too familiar with, are the viruses. And the viruses exist in a lot of different types, but they have some commonalities. One thing that's common to all of them is that there's some kind of nucleic acids. It might be DNA. But in other viruses, it, it might be RNA, depending on the type of virus and the family of virus. And they all have that nucleic acid that's surrounded by a protein coat. There are various shapes, and you can see just three viruses that are depicted here on this first page. If you look at this particular image right here, the first one here, this one virus particle that starts right here goes all the way to down here at the bottom and it goes on beyond that field of view. So that one's long and thin. We call it a filamentous virus. That one virus particle is that long. You can't see all of it in that particular image. If you look in the middle panel, you see a virus particle that's <coughs> kind of peculiar looking. It looks like some spaceship or outer space lunar lander or something like that. And down in this area, there are actually some fibers that help it to attach to the surface of the cell that it's going to infect. The virus in this panel is a bacteriophage, and it's one of the typical shapes of a bacteriophage, although there are lots of different ones. This one also looks like a bacteriophage of one type, but it could be a plant virus as well. The nucleic acids are down in this area that's called the head, and then this area is called the tail. 
And as I just said, the tail fibers help it to attach to the surface of the bacterium. We'll come back and talk about how these guys infect because just you just remember from just a few minutes ago, bacteria have a, a rigid cell wall on the outside. They've got a peptidoglycan covering the outside. So how does that virus infect the cell? And they've got some curious mechanisms to be able to do that. And we'll come in later chapters and talk about it. This virus is an envelope virus. That means besides the nucleic acids in the protein coat, there's a membrane on the outside of it. That membrane used to be the cytoplasmic membrane of the previous host cell. And as the virus left that cell, it stole part of the cytoplasmic membrane along with the proteins that it had embedded there. This one looks a lot like influenza. It looks like the influenza that's out there these days. And so hopefully you won't get too familiar with that type of virus. But at least now you know a little bit of what it looks like. So viruses have to infect living cells. We can't grow them without living cells. Um, those cells are called hosts. They use the host machinery. So they have to replicate their nucleic acids, and most of the time, if it's DNA, they're going to use the host machinery. Sometimes if their, if their genome is RNA, which is possible for some virus families, they might have to bring in their own enzymes to do that because cells don't have a mechanism to rep replicate RNA. They can make RNA from DNA, but most cells don't have machinery to be able to make RNA from RNA. Um, but they use the building blocks, all the nucleic acids for RNA and DNA, all the amino acids for protein synthesis, the lipids that they might need, and all the other components that they might need are going to be um, those of the host cell. So because of that, they're stealing components from the host cell. We call them obligate intracellular parasites. Parasites, that means they use resources of the host, and these guys are obligate. In other words, to do the things they do, to grow, to, to divide, they have to be inside of a cell. There are viruses that infect all three domains. Not the same virus, but we know viruses that can infect the bacteria. Uh, we know viruses that can infect the archaea. There are other viruses, obviously, that can infect the eukarya. One of the research projects that's going on in my laboratory right now is actually isolating bacteria phages, that's bacterial viruses, that can kill the organisms that cause cavities in our mouth. So it's possible later down the road, if you're interested, I may have you spit into a tube voluntarily because it's known that about 30% of humans carry viruses in their mouth that can actually kill some bacteria. And we're wanting to isolate as many of those viruses from as many sources as we can to hopefully someday make a mouthwash that just has pure viruses in it that people could gargle with that would go kill the bacteria that are going to cause cavities and hopefully leave the healthy bacteria alone and not kill those diseases. So we'll talk about that down the road. I've got to get uh, IRB approval um, before we can actually start collecting your spit. But if you feel compelled to spit into a test tube at some point, I might give you the opportunity to do that. Then there's the viroids. So if we took that virus that was on the previous page and isolated its DNA, its DNA would look about like this, this long. And its DNA is somewhere between 50 and 100,000 base pairs in length, just to give you an idea. And so that's a, a small viral genome. And then if you look closer, we've got these little things that are circled on this picture, and some of them are circled, some aren't. Those are the genomes of these molecules that are called viroids. Viroids are obviously much simpler than viruses. They're smaller than viruses. They, too, can only replicate with host cell machinery, and they are small pieces of naked RNA. In other words, RNA that's not coded by anything else. And so far, we only know of viruses that infect plants, that cause disease in plants. But I asked my 11 o'clock class, so I want to ask you guys too. In the other biology classes that you've taken, besides ribosomal RNA or rRNA and transfer RNA, tRNA, and messenger RNA, did you guys learn about any other classes of RNA in, in the courses that you've taken along the way? I know your backgrounds are all different, so. Genetics, we started covering more like small RNAs. Oh, small nuclear RNAs, yeah. Beautiful. So 
So in the last 10 years or so, we've figured out that there are other categories of RNAs that are down inside of the cell, and most lower-level biology classes don't have time to talk about those. But we're finding out small nuclear RNAs, there's another class that's called heteronuclear RNAs, and then there's an, another class still called microRNAs, and they each play a role in some biological function down inside of the cell. And when they're working right, they control the system. Some of them say, we've got this messenger RNA, it can code for a protein, but we don't need that protein anymore. We need to get rid of that messenger RNA so we don't waste the amino acids and make more of that protein. And some of them tag those messenger RNAs and say, get rid of it, kill it, break it down so it can't be used anymore. And others do other things. So far, though, we don't know of any, and those small RNAs are about the same size as these. We don't know of any diseases that are caused by those, but we can see them functioning in normal cells. And so... Some scientists speculate that they may be involved in human disease as well, but it's really hard to study these guys, especially when they have normal functions, but it's been documented as you transfer these from one plant to another, you can do that experiment, because people don't scream when plants get sick, but that they actually, when you transfer them, can transfer disease in the process. Then there's these guys, the prions. These guys are infectious proteins. They're just proteins. But if you look at the amino acid sequence of these proteins, there are proteins in our brain that have almost exactly the same amino acid sequence in our brain and presumably have some important function down inside of the brain. But these guys are folded differently. And you eat these guys and they get into your gut and they're not degraded by the acids in your stomach because of the way that they're folded, they make it through your stomach into the small intestines, and then they're able to get out of the small intestines into the capillaries. Once they get into the capillaries, it's an easy trek up to the brain where they lodge in the brain, and then they start messing with the proteins in the cells of your brain, and you get a, a slow neurologically degenerative disease when this happens. So we call them infectious proteins. Um, basically, they're misfolded versions of the normal proteins, and they form these fibrils as they're growing, so the proteins come together and start making fibers. Pretty soon it makes those areas of the brain that are infected spongy looking. You can see holes in the area where the cells in that area have died, and now they're, they're open holes in that area. The cells ultimately can't function. We've seen neurological uh, degenerative diseases resulting um, from these in animals and humans as well. Let me just digress a little bit and tell you a story. So in 1980, I was sitting in a chair just like you all. And in 1980, we knew about a disease that's caused by these prions. Some people say prions, others say prions. It's like tomato, tomato. Um, prions that cause disease. And the, the first disease that was observed was in sheep. And when sheep would get this disease, they didn't know what the causative agent was at that point, but sheep would get this disease, and it would start causing neurological problems. And think about what we raise sheep for. Some people eat the meat, but most people raise it for the wool. And they'll shear the sheep, they'll collect the wool, they let the sheep live as long as it grows wool. And so it's a slow neurological disease. And these older sheep started developing this disease. And when they got it, they would rub up against things like barbed wire fences and they would scrape themselves up. And so they called the disease in sheep scrapies. Pretty logical name, right? Because they would scrape themselves up. They would cause, they didn't apparently worry about the pain that was being associated with scraping themselves up. And they called it scrapies. That was identified way back in the 1930s, 1940s as being a, uh, somewhat common disease in sheep. So some of you live on ranches or farms and you raise animals, right? Why do you raise animals? Because they're cute and fuzzy, cuddly. Why do you raise animals? So ultimately you can sell them, right, and make some money. That's why people raise animals, to sell them or the products. And so the sheep herders were at some point wanting to sell the sheep, but you couldn't sell the sick ones that were scraped up that had this scrapies disease. So they'd sell the healthy ones. You got to do something with the sick ones. And the sheep herders would eat the sick ones because, hey, it's a good source of protein, meat there. Mutton's good and flavorful. So they would eat the meat. And pretty soon they started developing a disease that looked a lot like the scrapies that sheep were getting 15, 20 years later. And that disease was called, when I was sitting where you are, um, Jacob Jacob Kreuzfeld syndrome. Now it's called Kreuzfeld Jacob 
disease, and I hate it when they change names, but it's the same disease, and basically the sheep herders were eating those sheep that had prion disease. They were eating the meat and getting the same or similar prion disease. So that was recognized. By 1980, we already knew that it was a protein that was causing disease. People had isolated the protein and could demonstrate in other animals this protein can cause a similar type of disease. But remember, it's a slow neurological progressive disease. And so initially, for the first 5, 10 years, you might see nothing. 15, 20 years later, you start bang like a sheep or a goat and, or even worse things. So we did that experiment showed that it could be passed from sheep to humans, right? How many of you live on a ranch or know people who live on a ranch that, that raise cattle? All right, cool. So when you raise cattle, the, the calf is calved. What do you want to happen as quickly as possible? You want it to grow up, right? You want it to survive. And then what's the purpose of calving calves? Get them growing up, get as much mass on them as possible so that you can quickly sell them for meat and make money, right? So muscle is made out of what? That's what you're really trying to get on these cows as you're raising them. What's muscle made out of? It's not a trick question. Protein, right? Muscle's made out of protein. So uh, many of you have exercised and you want to, some of you guys want to bulk up your muscle. And so you know if you eat lots of amino acids, you can... That's the source that you need to make protein. So uh, when we slaughter animals in America, we don't usually eat the brain. But the brain's got lots of protein, very rich in nutrients, lots of lipids for energy. We usually also don't eat the organs and the digestive tract. But again, those have a lot of energy, lots of protein. So feed producers got this clever idea. We slaughter lots of sheep for their meat, and we waste a whole bunch of it. So if we take the brain the digestive tract and all the other organs, dehydrate them, grind them up, put them into cattle food. There's lots of amino acids, so cattle will bulk up very quickly. And then we can get the cattle grown up and we'll get more money because they've got more muscle tissue. And so it sounds like a really good idea, right? Except for they just redid the experiment again and they passed the scrapies proteins into this beautiful herbivore that would never ever consider eating a sheep and now the cow gets a prion degenerative disease called mad cow disease. You've all heard of it. That's how we introduced, that's a human caused disease because the cattle feed industry decided to take animal parts, grind them up and put them into the diet of a herbivore and the prions got from the sheep into the cattle and that made a big problem. Now many of you are going into healthcare and you want to help other people, so you go and donate your blood frequently, two, three, four times a year. Every time you go, they have you look through this book, they have you fill out a, a survey form, and it asks, did you live in Europe during these times? And it's, it's some years around the 1990s, right? Remember that? And if you check yes, they won't let you donate your blood. Because during that time period, mad cow disease was pretty prevalent in Germany. And people who ate the beef from Germany during that time might have prions circulating in their bloodstream and we don't have a way to detect prions in blood so that we can know which blood is contaminated with prion proteins. So that's the best way we can exclude those people is to ask did you live in Germany during this time period. Some, company, or some countries won't buy beef from the U.S. because we've had mad cow disease in the U.S. We think we got it under control. But remember, it's a progressive disease, and most cattle aren't kept longer than a few years unless they're dairy cattle. Most of the time, we keep them for two or three years, and then we slaughter them before the meat gets tough, and that's not long enough to figure out if mad cow disease is going to be in that particular individual cow. We don't have a good detection system to see those prions that are causing that disease. So it's a big problem. And it's also a big problem because it's resistant to most of the sterilization and disinfection mechanisms that we have. For most organisms, most viruses, in fact all of them, we can put them into a device that gets really high pressure, really hot, and it'll kill most organisms in 20-25 minutes. 
these guys don't get killed because remember they're just misfolded proteins and when you heat them up they're still just misfolded proteins and it doesn't kill them. There's some new systems that go much hotter and much higher pressure that appear to inactivate them a little bit. About the only way that you could inactivate them is if you cook your hamburger or your steak until it's totally carbon and then eat it. And most of us don't like our hamburger or our steak that way. And it's becoming more and more medically important. Just this last year, you might have heard about it, there was a lady that went in for brain surgery. And shortly after brain surgery, she started to progress into what appeared to be a prion-related type of disease. I guess they noticed it last year, and the surgery happened prior to that. And when they traced it back, there was a woman that had surgery in the same surgical suite just months before that did progress into a prion-related disease. And our, again, our chemicals that are used for sterilization of surfaces and other things can't deal with this particular protein. So it's becoming more and more med medically important and difficult to deal with. So this is the world that we're talking about, the microbial world that we'll be looking at. We've just talked through these infectious agents, and we'll come back and we'll spend significant time on those three groups later down the road. If we look over on the left-hand side, we can go here, and we've got the bacteria and the archaea. Those are the prokaryotes, right? They don't have a nucleus, so they're prokaryotes. They're unicellular. And then if we look down a little bit closer here, we've got the eukaryotes, that are members of the domain Eukarya, and these guys include the helmets, the worms, the fungi, which can be either unicellular or multicellular, and they include these two groups, the protozoa and the algae. There's a little problem with this figure, so I want to make sure you recognize it, and it's right here in this branch. Not all of the algae are protists. Which ones wouldn't be protists? Exactly, because what's the definition of a protist? A single-celled eukaryote, right? So the multi-celled ones are, are obviously excluded. I want to make sure you catch that so this figure doesn't mislead you. Only those that are unicellular in the algae side are going to be members of the protists. Okay, this figure is just for size to give you perspective, and it's showing you the average human. They use a two-meter tall human. I'm not quite there. Two meters is about 6'3", so if I get to there, I'm, I'm good. But that's this guy, and they're showing you the size of roundworms. They can be a couple of um, centimeters in length. But there are some worms that you'll look at that actually can be about two, three meters in length that love to live down inside of you, the tapeworms. And we'll come through and we'll look at these. All of this portion can be observed with the naked human eye on assisted vision. And then these guys we'll be able to see with our light microscope. That's why when you were looking at the yeast, I asked you to look down closely, see if you could see any nuclei down inside. If you had a really skilled eye, you might have been able to see mitochondria down inside, but the resolution on our light microscopes is a little bit limited in seeing things that are that small. These are plant cells. These are typical animal cells. Those can all easily be visualized. The smallest bacteria that we know of can't actually be visualized with the microscopes that we have in the laboratory and viruses certainly can't, but if we had an electron microscope, we can begin to see viruses, the ribosomes, and um, even the smallest bacteria all the way up through these cells here. Uh, we actually have microscopes now that can visualize molecules. There's a, we'll talk about it in Chapter 4, but there's a type of microscope that's called an atomic force microscope that can actually see atoms in molecules like DNA and other types of molecules, and we'll look at that down the road. So there's an enormous range of size. The largest eukaryotes are a million times larger than the smallest virus, and there's a lot of variation in these groups. Um, some bacteria, one that was discovered in the mid-90s, is actually visible to the naked eye. You can see it without a microscope or a lens. And there's others that have a volume that's 70 times larger um, we'll actually look at some of those guys larger than a typical eukaryotic cell. Uh, here's a couple of examples. If you look closely at this picture, these little cells down here are those paramecia that we saw blown up in the previous picture. And this is a bacterium. 
many times longer than those paramecia. And if you have a skilled eye and you hold up a slide that has paramecia fixed on it, and you look closely, you'll begin to perceive little specks with your naked eye that are the paramecia on that slide. So this one you can see without a microscope pretty easily. And one of the theories was that prokaryotes can't get large because they don't have all those convoluted membranes that provide surfaces for those enzymes that make energy, like the mitochondria, like the chloroplasts that we see in higher organisms, if you will. So the dogma said they can't get bigger, they have to stay small because they don't have enough membranes to make energy, to harvest energy and turn it into ATP for all of their functions that they need to do. Look at the scale on this figure and this figure. This scale, even though they're the same size, is actually twice as big. That means that when you look at one of these cells, if you want to compare this cell and this cell, that cell would actually be twice as big in diameter as what's pictured there. Everybody good with that? Okay, so this cell actually has the largest volume of any bacterial cell, and look closely at it. Can you see down inside of the cytoplasmic membrane there's some little yellow pigmented areas? Can you see those? So I'm told, no firsthand experience, but I'm told there are places that you can go and you can walk in, and if you have enough money, they will make this beverage for you. And they serve it in kind of a bowl-shaped cup, I'm told. And they'll take some ice and maybe some fruit and some other kind of liquid, and they put it in with that ice, and they blend it all up. Before they put it into the cup, they take that cup, and they wet the rim and then they take the cup and invert it and dip it into a bowl that has salt crystals in it. It comes out coated with salt crystals on the outside. And then they pour that frozen drink down in that bowl. Have you guys heard of something like that before? Yes. Yeah, what's that called? Margarita. Margarita. You guys know too much. I'm going to have to turn you all in. That's what it's called. And apparently the scientists that discovered this bacterium had experienced a margarita or two previously as well. When they saw those salt crystals around the outside of the bacterium, they said, that's interesting. And they figured out what those yellow crystals were. They're actually almost pure sulfur. What do you know sulfur from? You take this paper or wooden thing and you rub it on something that provides friction and it catches on fire, right? It's on the tip of matches, and you know from that experience that it burns. Sulfur's flammable. And so these bacteria live in an environment that's very rich in sulfur, and then there's another chemical in that environment as well, and they take that chemical and sequester it down inside of the cell in the cytoplasm, and they keep those two chemicals. If you took those two purified chemicals in a chemistry laboratory and put them both together in a test tube, they would spontaneously ignite. They would combust. They would go into fire. And these bacteria are pulling those two chemicals out of the environment and bringing them into the cell and sequestering them in large amounts, and they don't explode. They don't burn up, but they can keep them separated from each other, and they can gradually let them come together and release little bits of that energy when they need energy for their metabolic processes. So this cell was able to get much, much, much larger because... It's got now an energy source. It doesn't have to invest anything. It just pulls the chemicals in. It's got enzymes to allow them to react slowly so they don't burn up, and they can draw that energy back out. So now we're seeing prokaryotes that do something very different. They're able to take energy from different sources than we typically think of and be able to harvest that energy and use it. So that pretty much changed the paradigm and description of microorganisms. This one, by the way, the one on the far right, is the smallest uh, microorganism that we know of. And this definition right here, remember, I think I told you last time, whenever we make definitions, we always find some exception. So this genus actually has a membrane surrounding its nucleoid. What does that sound like? Sounds like a nucleus, right? Uh, but scientists don't want to hedge there because it actually has peptidoglycan in its outer cell wall. And it does something else that most microbiologists would tell you bacteria and archaea can't do. It does endocytosis. Endocytosis is a fancy word to describe what? Taking things into the cell. 
The major one that you learned about was phagocytosis. You should have learned about penocytosis. Those are two forms of endocytosis. Both of those involve the cytoplasmic membrane allowing something to come in and engulfing it and then bringing it as a vesicle down inside of the cell. This particular bacterium does that. But the textbooks all say bacteria don't do endocytosis. This guy breaks a couple of their rules. So he's kind of on the fence. Where do you put him? He's got peptidoglycan, so you've got to put him in the bacteria. But he's starting to look a little bit more eukaryotic, and so it blurs some of the lines that we typically use. So then we had the second golden age of microbiology. Some people say we're still in that. Um, less than 1% of prokaryotes have ever been studied, and that's because we can't grow most of them in the laboratory. We don't know what they need. We don't know those growth conditions that they need, but we've got some new techniques. Now we don't even have to culture them to figure out what they can do. Now we can just go into materials like your fecal material or soil and pull out the DNA from those materials or any place else that you're interested in looking. Pull out all of the DNA, begin to sequence it because the technologies for DNA sequencing are so much advanced. Sequence all the DNA there. The computers can then start to glue together all the little bits and say this is one organism, this is another, this is another, and you can begin to see what all of the organisms in that environment look like, at least genetically, what they look like. Then you can begin to figure out what kind of metabolic properties they have, what are the toxins they might make, and all kinds of different things that they might be able to do. For example, just a few years ago, some scientists went to the Sargasso Sea, they pulled out some water, and they did that with the water from that sea, and they found 1,800 new species that hadn't ever been identified. So with technology today, you can go pretty much anywhere and find organisms that haven't been characterized or identified before. I teach a senior level bacteriology class, and that's one of the first exercises that we do. I tell them, go out and get isolates from as many diverse places as you can. We isolate, purify, and then begin to characterize some of those organisms um, to figure out if we found any new bugs along the way. Still, we've got all this technology, and there's lots of challenges that remain, and part of that is just um, understanding the fundamental biological questions about the microbial world that's out there. So that's the end of chapter two.